Hi, welcome to the Quick Solutions All India Akas Test Series JE Advanced 2020 Test 3A Paper 2 Code ENF Physics. Let's go to question number one. Question one says a charged particle is projected from origin with initial velocity vi cap minus vj cap, uniform electric field E naught and magnetic field B naught exist in the region along positive y direction. If particle returns to origin after traveling minimum distance, then we have these four options about the values of and we have to of course find the correct option. Now, well, the question is from the topic moving charges and magnetism. It's about motion of a charged particle in a uniform electric and magnetic field. Now, if we look at the data given, the initial velocity which, which the particle is being projected is given as Vi cap minus Vj cap and the electric field and the magnetic field both are directed along the y axis. Okay, So, this is the situation, this is the y axis. Let's say particle is being projected from here with this velocity. If I call this axis as the x axis, then the initial velocity is uh, something like this vi cap minus vj cap, that means it is directed like this. Okay, So, this is initial velocity vi cap minus vj cap. Now, the question says that the particle returns to origin and it has to travel the minimum distance in doing so. Now, let us analyze what kind of motion is the particle going to have. Well, particle is going to have a motion which will be essentially helical, right? Because the particle, number one, there is both electric and magnetic field parallel to each other. Number two, the particle has initial velocity perpendicular to both, uh, in fact, has initial velocity which has components both opposite to the electric field as well as perpendicular to the electric and magnetic field both. And the electric force on the particle will be in the y direction, right? But initial velocity along y direction is in fact in the negative y direction. And due to the component of velocity which is perpendicular to the y axis, that means in the xz plane, particle is going to have circular motion. So, its motion is essentially a superposition of circular motion parallel to the xz plane and accelerated motion where the speed is changing, changing speed along y direction. Okay? Well, motion is accelerated even along the xz plane, but the component of velocity in the xz plane will have a constant magnitude. The direction of course is going to change. Now, for y coordinate to become 0 again, we write that displacement along y direction is 0. So, y is 0 and displacement along y direction is initial component of velocity along y direction which is minus v naught. So, it is minus v naught t plus half a y t square and a y here is electric force divided by the mass of the particle. Electric force is E naught times Q divided by mass of the particle. So, it is V naught t plus half A t square and when I put this to 0, the value of t comes out to be equal to 2 m V naught divided by E naught Q. Right? Well, there is no V naught as such, there is V only. So, let us remove the naught subscript. So, this is the time the particle is going to take to make its y coordinate 0 again, right? After its motion has started. Now, if its x and z coordinates have to become 0 again, 
that means the particle has completed one revolution right since the particle is returning to the same point so it means that the time taken t must be equal to n times where n is an integer time period of revolution and the time period of revolution is 2 pi m by q b so that means we have 2 m v by e naught q equals n times 2 pi m by q into b naught and since the particle is traveling the minimum distance the value of n we can take as 1 now if that is the case then the value of v is coming out to be equal to pi e naught divided by b naught right so the value of v we are getting is pi e naught by b naught and if we look at the options it is matching with option a so option a is correct for question one let's go to the next question now question two says two infinitely long conducting parallel rail are connected through a capacitor c as shown a conductor of length l is moving with constant acceleration a naught starting from t equal to zero variation of current through conductor with time t is shown by the curve neglect resistance of rails and conductor so this is the situation depicted we have a capacitor here and these are the two parallel rails and this is a conducting rod of length l which is moving with constant acceleration a naught starting from time t equal to zero so and the graphs are all current versus time graph so let's find the expression now in this question as this rod is made to move in the magnetic field there will be motional emf produced the question is clearly from the topic electromagnetic induction so the expression for velocity v is we can take it as a t if so in fact a naught t because the acceleration is a naught so this is velocity at time t and the emf e motional emf across the rod is b l v so that means it's equal to b l a naught times t and uh, we can now apply the Kirchhoff's law for this loop and if we do that we get B L A naught into T in fact we can also uh, take uh, the sense of uh, the direction of the induced EMF induced motional EMF and suppose the velocity is in this direction so we can see that V cross B A will be in the upward direction and so that means the current will flow in the anti-clockwise sense okay and if the charge on the capacitor is Q let's say plus and minus then we have the equation by applying the Kirchhoff's loop law that BL A naught T minus Q by C is equal to zero and so the expression for charge on the capacitor qt is b l a naught c times t where c the capacitance and we can get the expression for current by simply differentiating q respect to time so the current i is dq by dt and this comes out to be b l a naught c which actually is constant it's not a function of time so current turns out to be a constant function which actually is matching with option B. So option B is correct for question 2. Let's now go to the next question. Question 3 says in a standard YDSE a parallel light beam containing wavelength lambda 1 equal to 4000 angstrom and lambda 2 equal to 6000 angstrom is incident on diaphragm having two narrow slits. Separation between slits is 1 millimeter and distance of screen from slits is 1 meter then distance of nearest point from central maxima where maxima due to both the waves coincides is okay so 
Well, it's a question from YDSC, uh, that is Wave Optics, which is part of, in fact, Wave Optics. The situation is something like this. We have two slits, let's say, like this. And this is the screen. And we know that this point will be the point of central maximum. And we have to find a location where maxima due to both the wavelengths overlap and the minimum distance at which it is going to happen. Well, let's say this is mth maximum for lambda 1. Then the equation is then that m capital D by small d lambda 1 that is the position of mth maximum for lambda 1 and this is equal to n times d by small d lambda 2 and clearly m and n have to be integers. So what we are getting now is that m lambda 1 has to be equal to n lambda 2. Let's put the values of lambda 1 and lambda 2 and if we do that we find that m into 4 will be equal to n into 6 or 2m will be equal to 3n. Now for the point to be nearest to the central maximum we have to look at minimum lowest values of m and n and it's very clear that that minimum value for m will be 3 and for n it's going to be 2. So with that now we can easily find the distance and that minimum distance from the central maximum will be 3 times capital D by small d lambda 1 where lambda 1 is 4000 angstrom. Let's put the values now. The values are now 3. Capital D by small d capital D is 1 meter and small d is 1 millimeter so it's 10 to the power 3 and this is 4000 angstrom and that means 10 to the power minus 3. In fact, one angstrom is 10 to the power minus 10 meter but if we convert this into millimeter then this is 10 to the power minus 7 millimeter because the options are in millimeter. Let's evaluate this further. This is coming out to be 1.2 millimeter, right? And if we look at the options, it is matching with option D. So option D is correct for question 3. Let's go to the next question now. Question 4 says, a gun of mass M without bullet fires a bullet of mass M by 8 with horizontal speed 100 meter per second. The gun is fitted with a concave mirror of focal length 15 centimeter facing the receding bullet. The speed of the image of the bullet just after firing the bullet is. Well, the question involves concepts of ray optics as well as conservation of linear momentum. Let's say that this is the mirror attached to the gun. We consider that the mirror fixed to the gun is moving in this direction and uh, the bullet itself which has mass m by 8 so let's say it has mass m by 8. It's moving towards left with 100 meter per second. That's what we are assuming. Now if we conserve linear momentum, then the velocity of mirror towards right is going to be 100 by 8 meter per second because, well, m1 v1 will be equal to m2 v2 where v1 and v2 are speeds. So m by 8 into 100 is equal to m into velocity of mirror towards right and that velocity we can easily find is equal to 100 by 8 meter per second. Okay. Now the situation just after firing a bullet. Well just after firing a bullet, the bullet position will be in fact very close to the mirror and in that case the velocity of bullet respect to the mirror will be 100 plus 100 by 8 meter per second towards left, right? So this is 100 plus 100 by 8, that means it's equal to 900 by 8 meter per second towards left. This is the initial velocity 
of bullet with respect to the mirror and uh, since it is very close to the mirror there is no separation between the bullet and mirror at this time so the velocity of image with respect to mirror will be 900 by 8 meter per second but not towards left but towards right okay so this is 900 by 8 meter per second towards right this is the velocity of image with respect to the mirror just after firing of bullets okay and why i am getting this because we relate the two velocities by simply differentiating the equation that 1 by u plus 1 by v is 1 by f we differentiate this and by differentiating we get minus 1 by u square du by dt minus 1 by v square dv by dt is 0 and so the expression for dv by dt comes out to be equal to minus of v square by u square into du by dt so it's very clear that the direction of velocities of the two that means direction of velocity of object respect to the mirror and direction of velocity of image respect to the mirror will be in opposite directions from this equation and uh, at that particular instant the magnitude are equal so this is what we are getting now we have to find the velocity of image respect to the ground so we can see that this value is velocity of image respect to the ground minus velocity of the mirror respect to ground and that velocity is 100 by 8 meter per second so it means that the velocity of image at that instant is going to be equal to 900 by 8 plus 100 by 8 and which is equal to 1000 by 8 meter per second let's do the division and if we do that let's first divide by 4 so this is 2 and this is 250 and on further simplifying this is 125 meter per second so it is matching with option B so option B is correct let's go to the next question now question 5 says electron in hydrogen like atom with z equal to 2 make transition from third excited state to second excited state and from second excited state to first excited state the stopping potential for the photo electrons ejected from a metal by larger wavelength is 1.24 volt stopping potential corresponding to shorter wavelength will be okay so there are two transitions which are being talked about so one transition is from third excited state to second excited state that means in terms of n so one transition is from n equal to 4 to n equal to 3 and the other transition is from second excited state that means from n equal to 3 to n equal to 2 now wavelength because the energy corresponding to the first transition is less compared to the energy of photon corresponding to the second transition so the photon corresponding to the first transition will have greater wavelength and uh, let's write the expression for energy of the photon so energy of the photon in the first case E1 is 13.6 electron volt into z square that means 4 into 1 by 3 square which is 1 by 9 minus 1 by 4 square which is 1 by 16 and this is of course in electron volt let's simplify this further this is 13.6 into 4 and on the denominator we take 144 and there in the numerator we will have 16 minus 9 that is 7 this is even energy of photon for the first transition for the second transition let's say the energy is E2 and this is equal to 13.6 into 4 into 1 by 4 minus 1 by 9 in electron volt this is 13.6 into 4 into 
9 minus 4 that is 5 by 36 electron volt. Now let's utilize the other information which is given. It says the stopping potential for photoelectrons ejected from ejected from metal by larger wavelength is 1.24 volt. That means we have E1 minus the work function is equal to 1.24 electron volt, right? And we have to find the stopping potential for the shorter wavelength photon. Sorry, we have to find the stopping potential for photoelectrons emitted by the shorter wavelength, which means we have to find E2 minus phi. This value is what we have to find. And uh, we have the value of E1. So we can easily find the value of phi. It's a matter of doing the calculations now. And if we do that, and we also calculate the value of E2 from the expression that we have got here, we find that the value of E2 minus phi comes out to be equal to 6.15 electron volt approximately, which means that the stopping potential for photoelectrons in the second case will be 6.15 volt, which means that option C is correct. Let's go to the next question now.